Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're continuing a series of messages on the theme, Did God Really Say? Lies that Sound True. This series focuses on a number of sayings popular in the culture and among Christians that can be problematic. Sayings that are true up to a certain point, but from a different perspective, or so it's okay. Now, let me say at the very beginning that this topic can be taken on several different levels and several different directions. I have chosen but one path and have ignored all the other possibilities. Those options would have to be taken up in a different time, a different sermon, or a different Bible class. There's a lot to say. So I apologize that I'm going to be reading my sermon for you this morning. Mainly to keep it flowing quickly. But there's a lot to say. God made you this way. So it's okay. What way? Well, the person that you are today. The results of a process that began in your mother's womb when God got out his knitting needles and he knitted you into your basic form, shape, and person. But then it also continued as he continues to shape you even today and as long as you're alive to become the person he intends for you to be. Today's Old Testament lesson reflects that truth. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows that very well. Well, the scripture has a lot of important information to impart, an affirmation to me. Number one, our being and all of its parts, our body and souls, our minds and emotions, our talents and personality, our gifts of God. From our days in our mother's womb, he used nature. That is our DNA. That was kind of the blueprint for the rollout. But beyond our birth, he also used nurture. That is parental upbringing, education, training, and life experiences to mold us into the people that we are today. Now, we might have wished that he had made us differently, perhaps more athletic, or perhaps you wished that you had been a better scholar, better looking and not so plain, or maybe a little bit taller so you could reach the things on the top shelf, or maybe a little less pear-shaped. At creation, when God finished, he looked at all that he had made and he breathed a sigh and said, it is very good. The pleasure of a finished creation that turned out well. Well, with the psalmist, we can assume that when he looks at us, even though we are yet unfinished products, we are a creation still in process. He says the same. Ah, it's going well. Ergo, I can say, God does all things well. It's okay. I'm okay. Number two, we are intentionally made. The text says, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. My oldest daughter, she loves to knit. She's going all the time. Ask her, what, what are you doing? What are you making? Oh, I just love to knit. No, she's got a product in mind, a scarf, or maybe those driver gloves for cold weather the ones with no fingers. Well, 
Same way with God. When he began to knit, we were not intended to be cosmic accidents. We were created by God on purpose and for a purpose. Number three, we are unique. Look at your hands. The lines on the tips of your fingers, your fingerprints are unique. So unique that you can be identified by the fingerprint that you leave. Same thing with the DNA, the blueprint for your rollout. That's unique too and can be used to identify you. You are a unique, unrepeatable miracle of God. And number four, what makes us even more special and unique, we are created in God's image. We read in Genesis 1 that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Because God is a spirit, it certainly can't mean that we resemble him when we look into the mirror. Oh, that's what God looks like. Yeah, no, no, it's an inward thing. First of all, we were created for a special relationship with him. Different from anything that the animals might have. Second, we were meant to reflect something of his inner nature, his inner character here in the world. And third, we were given a status among all the other living creatures, a status that was, as the psalmist says in Psalm 8, just a little lower than the angels. So we were created very special. And that is true of every human being in us in the same way. We do well to respect all other people's lives and the gifts that God has given them. But what if some hitch takes place in the womb or at the birth time or as a result of some calamitous event later on? And it results in a person with a crippling disability. That can't possibly be okay, can it? Today's gospel, we hear that Jesus walking through the town of Jerusalem, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. Uh oh. We don't have to look very far ourselves to see someone with a question, and I give you the wrong answer to a question you never asked. <laughs> Others are very obvious, and we can see it, but we don't have to look very far. We may have people living with a disability in our own family, in our own home. We certainly can see it here even today in our faith community. And we certainly can find it out there in our residential community. People with impaired vision or hearing or speech, the ability to walk and use their hands and arms, learning ability, physical, mental, and emotional health, limited social skills and the like. Now, sometimes this may have very modest effects on their life, but other times the effect can be pretty major. A major impact upon their own personal happiness or ability to live independently and productively and the ability to get along socially with others. Now, Jesus' disciples also saw the man that was blind from birth. And they asked Jesus a very strange question. Uh, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? There's no expression of compassion here, which is amazing since these men had spent several years following Jesus day in and day out, and he was the very 
model of compassion. Indeed, not even as much as reaching into their pocket to see if they had a coin to put in the poor man's hat. No, just a moralistic judgment dressed up as a question. Who sinned, this man or his parents? Why did they need to know? Was it perhaps to determine whether or not the man and his parents were worthy of their attention? Well, it can be a game that we play. Jesus' disciples even today can play that game, and all too often. But confronting such example of crippling disability, the devil also comes sneaking around to whisper in our ears. And he says something like this, Oh, so your God is such a wonderful God and does all things well. Well, you may be one of the lucky ones, but what about that family with the son over there, the son who was born blind? Did your God knit him together while in his mother's womb? Would you call the result a person fearfully and wonderfully made? Does your God do all things well? How can you respect, love, and trust a God who carelessly drops a stitch while knitting a person in his mother's womb? Or allows a beautiful life to be badly marred by a calamitous situation in life? Good grief. That can't be okay, can it? Obviously, if God afflicts it or allows it, he doesn't value people very much. That's a lie, of course, as we shall see. But even the most loyal of Christians wrestles with that feeling from time to time. Am I not right? We certainly don't have all the answers to the problem of suffering and disabilities. What we do have to take into consideration and to reckon with on the basis of Scripture itself is the fact that we no longer live in the perfect world that God created at the very beginning. It's a fallen world resulting from Adam and Eve's primeval disobedience a disobedience that introduced into the world further disobedience, disharmony, and death. And their children inherited that earth. Who sinned, we might ask? Oh, well, don't lay it just at the door of Adam and Eve. All Scripture says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's true. For we have inherited their sinful nature. And we, as we have often confessed in the liturgy, O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto thee all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended thee, and justly deserve thy temporal and eternal punishment. Like the man in the gospel and his parents and all descendants of Adam and Eve, we too need a savior to come and shed the light of his grace upon us and work God's works in us to give us hope for something better. Well, Jesus cast a different light on the issue of a blind man's disability. He rejects the premises that they were working on and he says, and it is not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be away from trying to assign blame for this man's problem and to measure the gravity of the sin by the gravity of the disability. But instead, he puts our focus on the reason for hope that lies within his own restorative mission as God's servant and Messiah. Jesus said in the gospel this morning, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. 
a light that breaks through the darkness of our fallen situation with its consequences and promises the dawn of a new day, a new life. He came into our world to set the stage for God's work of restoring his fallen creatures, his fallen children, and welcoming them back to paradise. Jesus says that there is a work which he must do while it is day, while he, the light of the world, is among them. For three years, he worked day and night as God's agent, ministering to people disabled by illness, paralysis, blindness, isolation from God and society, spiritual oppression, aging, and death, and healing them. Be a new day. Yet the most critical aspect of that work that he had come to do was drawing close at hand. He, the light of the world, must face a darkness greater than any blind man experienced. The darkness of Good Friday with his emotional pain, the pain of rejection by his people and the desertion by his uh, disciples. Physical pain due to the beating and the crucifixion. Spiritual pain, the feeling of God forsaken us as the one who is bearing in his body all the sins of the world and paying the price for atonement. And finally, the greatest darkness of all, death. The day when no man can work, even on that day of his death and the next, he did nothing. But his work wasn't finished. No, it wasn't a failure. Because on Easter, the sun, the light of the world arose, and the hopes of the world rose with him, the hope of a destiny beyond the grave. On be with him and his father forever when our life here is finished. And then on the very last of all days, the souls of his followers will be reunited with their resurrected and glorified body as would be fitting for eternal life with God in heaven, his new heaven and his new earth, a veritable paradise restored with all of his blessings. For the man born blind, Jesus initiates the work of restoration right then and there. First, Jesus restores his natural light, his sight. He first takes and makes a little mud, never mind the details of how he made the mud, put it on his eyes and send him to the pool of Siloam, some distance away, and to wash his eyes. And when he did, he regained his sight. For the first time, he saw the light of day. Can you imagine what that feeling must have been? It was like a whole new life. And then Jesus perfects the man's spiritual insight. Jesus finds him a bit later. Now remember, up until this time, the man born blind. But later Jesus found him, and he faced him off. And he says, tell me, do you believe in the Son of Man? By the way, that's a messianic title. Who is he, sir? Tell me that I may believe in him. Jesus says, you have now seen him. And in fact, he is the man speaking to you. What a wake up call that was. Ah, the man said, Lord, no longer a polite sir, but he uses the very term that the Jews always use to address God. Lord, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped Jesus. From this day on, the life of the man born blind will be bathed in physical light of day and the spiritual light of hope based on the Jesus, his person, and his work. Yes, he will still be a work in process. There is still yet to come, but it will be made complete on the day of resurrection. 
It is my prayer that today's gospel is bringing you to gain new insight and faith into the person and the restorative work of Jesus as God's Messiah. So that with eyes of faith wide open, you too may embrace the light of the world and worship him. But I'm also concerned that Jesus opens your social and relationship eyes so that you will be able to see people, and especially those with disabilities, in a new way. Or should I say, with a better attitude of heart. So how do we respond when we see people with disabilities? Do we do like those disciples did on that day? with seeing them as a moralistic, political, or theological problem? Why are there so many people with disabilities in the world? And who or what is responsible for so much of the heartbreak? And who should be responsible to pay for it? Is it a matter of personal responsibility or the responsibility of his family? I can tell you as one who has been a caregiver, along with my wife, for someone with disabilities, that it can cost a family much time, much energy, and much money. Or is it a matter of the government, and inevitably it's the taxpayers who will pay the bill? Or about it? Well, you betcha he cares, and that's why he sent Jesus. And that's why Jesus faced the darkness that he did, so that we might come into the light. Besides, we could argue, aren't there professional people? I mean, this is something, not for laymen, this is for doctors, this is for professional counselors, this is for social workers, this is for educators, et cetera, et cetera. There's nothing really I can do or need to. Do we regard them only as objects of our pity? Oh, the poor soul. I wonder how his family deals with it. It must be terribly hard on them. Here, I'll put a penny in the poor man's hat. Well, maybe that's a step in the right direction, but it's not completely okay. People with disabilities don't need your pity or your alms. What they do need is your awareness, your understanding, your inclusion, your accommodation, and someone willing to be their friend. Do we regard them to be, because of their limitations, of people of little value to add to our circle? What do they have to give to us? What do they add to our congregation or to our circle of friends, or for that matter, what do they add to society? Hmm. We often make the mistake of defining people by their disability. It happens when we call someone a blind person, and primarily by their disability. Better to say he is a person who happens to be blind, or a person who has, developed, who has developmental disabilities. Their disability is only one aspect of their personal of their person. These people are more than the sum of their disabilities. Each of them also has certain abilities that can bless. And each of them can be, as was the man born blind in the gospel, a life in which the works of God could be displayed in them or through them. Do we find ourselves focusing on some behavior of the person, the person with disability that strikes us as strange or disruptive or makes us feel uncomfortable or embarrassed because we don't know how we should react? Are we tempted to avoid them or treat them as if they were invisible? Or as one congregation I know, ask the persons with disability not to return to worship because certain behaviors of those were disrupted to the worship of others. Then maybe we're the problem. 
and not them. That's not okay. Do we see people with disabilities as ministry opportunities? I'm going to ask you a series of questions and ask you to raise your hands. Please play along with me. How many of you have some disability that has a significant event on your ability to freely to be physically and socially active? Raise your hand. Oh, raise them high so people can see it. Okay, thank you. Put it down now. How many of you live with someone with significant disability? Of your extended family who has a significant disability? All right, thank you. And how many of you have a friend or neighbor who has a significant disability? All right. Now, how many of you raised your hand somewhere through that series of questions? If you even raised it only once, please raise it now and hold it up high. Okay, now take a look around the room. Now you're beginning to get a measure of the impact disability has on our community, as well as our individual lives of people that we know very well. To the extent that we gathered here this morning are representative of the Napa community, multiply that then many times over to the 75,000 people that are part of our community. Now, a very reputable ministry has done a lot of research in this whole area. And their discovery is that about 80% of the people that we have just described, 80% of the community of, of people with disability impact are unchurched. Over and against the general population, which is closer to 50%. They represent the largest field, a, a target field, held here last Tuesday evening to discussing how we as a congregation can involve more people with disabilities in the worship life and education life, the fellowship life, the various activities that we have here that how can we reach them to help them become disciples too and walk with us in the light? And we will continue to meet, planning a disability ministry here at St. John's, not just as another program among many programs that we have, but rather as an attitude and an approach. Please continue to pray for that group as they meet and as they plan and as we make known when our meeting times will, feel free to come and join us and contribute your thoughts too. So why does God allow so many people to live with disabilities and to experience his impacts? There was a dear soul, a former member of this congregation. She's now a member of the church above. Her name was Maria Wiebe. Maria was a big woman. She had a big heart. And she had a big heart for children with intellectual disabilities. And she, together with some other Christians uh, from the Napa community, were involved in a ministry of working with them during a release time, doing a Sunday school. Okay, maybe it was on a Wednesday, but it, it was like a Sunday school. And many young children were learning to know about Jesus. But the question tormented, oh, Vater, she was German. Vater, Vater, how can there be so many? Why are there so many? Why, Father? why? And one day, God answered her prayer. I knew Marie very well, and Marie, when she said that God to talked to her, I firmly believe it. He said to her, Maria, so that my people can learn how to love. 
The issue isn't, doesn't God care? Jesus proves that God does and is working out his plan to make all things new and blessing-filled for all. The issue is, do we care? And are we ready to embrace and willing to embrace an approach to people with disabilities that can draw them into our circle of discipleship and those who enjoy the light and the grace and the love of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? Creative and caring Father, thank you for making us the people we are. Thank you for sending Jesus to bring us the light of salvation and for opening our spiritual eyes of faith to embrace his work of restoration in our lives. Give us hearts that care for others, even those who need an extra measure of our understanding, accommodation, and friendship. Help us as a congregation to develop an attitude and an approach to those with disabilities and to their caregivers. In Jesus' name. Amen.